so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. It's 2003, and Holly Dean Johns is once again trying her best to sleep in the 20 centimetre patch of floor she's been assigned in her Thai prison cell. There are 200 women around her. Everyone's bodies are pressed against each other, stomach to back, in lines on the wooden floor. It's humid and nauseating, and everyone's skin feels like it's melted together in one sticky mess. When someone wants to turn over in their sleep, the whole line has to move. When someone gets up to go to the toilet, Their spot is quickly filled by prisoners eager for a tiny bit more space to stretch out. There's 10 toilets for 2,000 prisoners, and sickness and death is everywhere. In Lat Yao, the conditions are horrific. Holly, a Perth girl, caught in Bangkok with heroin, is living like an animal. Whatever your idea of hell is, multiply it by 1,000, and that is Holly's reality. Never in her wildest imagination had she pictured conditions so grim. She's been here for three years already, and pretty soon she'll find out her sentence. She's just lucky she wasn't caught with more. It'd be the death penalty. But she knows the punishment will be severe. Looking around her, she can see the life and light has gone in many of the women's eyes around her, they sort of just have a blank stare. It scares her. She can feel her own mind changing. Can she survive this? Will she survive this? And if she does, will she still have her sanity by the end? Will she still be Holly? I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Holly grew up one of five children in a wealthy area of Perth. When her family's real estate business went bust, her mother started a successful escort agency to keep their lavish lifestyle intact. But her parents' relationship was abusive, and when they finally split... Holly's mum met someone new that changed everything. Simon was a heroin addict. Pretty soon her mother was too, and the family's comfortable lifestyle collapsed as addiction took over. It didn't take long for Holly and her siblings to also become reliant on heroin. By the age of 20, Holly was in prison on drugs charges. By the age of 21, her mother had died of an overdose. But Holly's hell was only just beginning. In August 2000, she was arrested in Thailand on more drugs charges, except there, the ramifications were much, much more serious. Sentenced to 31 years behind bars in a Thai prison, the things Holly has seen and experienced are hard to comprehend. It took seven and a half years for her to be extradited home, where she did another five years in an Australian prison before finally being released in 2012. Holly has been clean since 2001, and after avoiding the media and every attempt by the likes of places like 60 Minutes and major Australian mastheads who wanted to tell her story while she was still in Thailand, she's finally ready to talk. She's just released a book. It's called Holly's Hell, Seven Years in a Thai Prison. She joins us now. Holly, I want to start with your childhood. You describe it as being idyllic from the outside. What does that mean? What did that look like? So I would describe my childhood as being fairly normal up until I was 12. Yeah, well, just like any other family, I suppose until my parents separated, and that's when everything changed. So my mother ended up 
seeing a guy who we had no idea was a heroin addict. We didn't know really what drugs were. Never seen heroin. We didn't know anybody that used heroin. Drugs just weren't a part of our life. So, yeah, my mum didn't find out he was actually a heroin user for a few months. We didn't know the signs. We didn't know anything about it. So when somebody's putting on a facade, they can't keep that up for too long. So it eventually crumbles and you see the person for who they really are, and that's what happened. So, yeah, my mum started using as well. From there, there's five of us siblings. Every one of us became addicted to heroin and every single one of us ended up in prison. It just goes to show how quickly that drug can take hold. You talk about how your family was really quite wealthy at one point. Your mum had like a Rolls Royce and she'd buy $1,000 dresses without even thinking and then all of a sudden she was struggling to make payments. She was on the dole. You were a teenager, a kid. Was it hard to watch your mum decline that quickly in terms of her living arrangements? Oh, for sure. And I really believe that my mother at one stage had a nervous breakdown, for sure. Going from being very wealthy to living in mansions, driving very expensive cars, buying $5,000 dresses and not even thinking about the price. Going from that to living in one of the worst suburbs in Perth, driving terrible little car. So just going from that to that, it's like night and day. So that for sure paid a big part in my mother's mental state. You were 15 when you first tried heroin. What were the circumstances that led to you trying it? So... It wasn't a secret that my mother now used it. It was in the home. So I guess as a 15-year-old, you're seeing other people doing it and you're thinking, well, it must be all right. So, yeah, I'd ask her many times, can I try? And she always said no until one day she said yes. Do you remember that first time? Yeah. What was it like? It was great. That's why I kept using it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you hear of people saying try heroin once and that's it. Well, it really was. That was it. It's that addictive. Yeah. So your mum's boyfriend, he kind of changed the course of really your whole family's life. Mm -hmm. And he did stick around for a while. For a long time. Was there a point that he left or your mum was able to break away from that? Their relationship was, he was a heroin addict. He had no money. He had nothing. My mum had it all. So it became a merry-go-round of he would steal her money, he would steal jewellery, whatever, to get money. So, yeah, it became a never-ending cycle of, you know, they'd get into an argument over something, she'd kick him out, he'd go away for a little while, come back. It was that revolving door. It was always kicking him out, he'd come back, they'd make up. Yeah, that went on for years. And we just couldn't understand why she kept doing it. Like, what are you doing? Did she ever consider sending you and your siblings to live with your dad? We had the choice of who we wanted to live with because my dad moved back to Melbourne. None of us kids wanted to go. We were all in school. We had our friends. Had our life here. And if I'm honest, I didn't want to go with dad because he was strict. (laughs) Mum wasn't. So when you're a kid, especially a teenager, You don't want a strict parent. You want to be able to sort of do what you want when you want to do it. I want to talk about Stephen. When did you meet him? When I was 15, through one of my brothers. Yeah. You've called him your soulmate. Did you know that from the start when you were 16? Yeah. I don't know if you've experienced it. Have you ever met somebody and you just instantly have a connection? You feel like you've known them forever. Mm -hmm. That was what it was like for us. I knew from the start. So you were in a relationship from 16? Yeah. And he used drugs as well? Yeah. So what did that look like in your relationship? How did drugs play a role in He didn't know I was using Ah. for a long time. Nobody did. I kept it hidden. I guess you could say I was a functioning heroin addict. I was still eating normally. I wasn't losing weight as you normally would, and that's because I was eating. 
I was still doing normal day-to-day things that a person has to do. So if I never told you I was a user, you would never know. You wouldn't know it. Why didn't you tell him if he was using too? I didn't want anyone to know. Okay. I didn't want my mother to know. Like, yeah, I'd use one time with her, but she didn't know that I was, I kept on doing it. Mm. No one had any idea. So when did you tell him? Oh, gee, so long ago, it's hard to remember the time frames. Probably about a year after we met. Yeah, my mum. That's a long time to keep up a facade. Yeah, my mum was starting to get worried about me because she could see that I was having mood swings. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's a part of addiction. She thought I was having a, a breakdown. And she said, look, you know, I want you to go and stay, you know, with your girlfriend up in Port Hedland, get away from Perth for a while, have some time with your friends. And I was like, oh, I did not want to go, but I wanted to make her think that, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, you know. I was up there for two days, hated it, <laughs> got on a bus, <laughs> rang Stephen and I said, I'm coming home, don't tell mum. And he said, well, I don't want to lie. So, yeah, I came back and mum found out. <laughs> so once... Stephen did know you were using, you both started, is this the right term, making home bake? Oh, that was a few years later. That was further down the line, but yeah. What does that mean? So back at that time, home bake became a new novelty, I suppose. A lot of people were making it. So in my house, it looked like a science experiment. (laughs) Like a lab. It was like a lab. You had to be really careful making this stuff. A lot of people's houses blew up. Wow. Exploded. Yeah, like it's dangerous. You're mixing (laughs) very toxic chemicals. And we didn't know what we were doing. We were following a recipe that was given to us by somebody that knew how to make it. So we just followed that to a T. Nothing ever went wrong, thankfully. That was like a big thing for a while, the new home bake thing. And was that to feed your addiction? Yeah, and to sell. And to sell. Yeah. Prison wasn't a foreign concept to you by the time you ended up in one. You already had relatives inside when you were a teenager. Mm. Was it your brothers that went to prison first? Your sister also ended up in prison? How did that happen? So my two older brothers ended up in prison first, again through crimes because they were using. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they ended up in jail for quite a long time in many different ones. So, yeah, as a teenager I'd go and visit them whenever I could. I wasn't old enough to drive, so I was always on buses, trains, hitchhiking, always late at night. These days you couldn't do that. Mm. There's no way. And luckily nothing ever happened to me, which was so lucky because I don't think nowadays it would be like that. Did their incarceration make you nervous that you were going to get caught? There's always that thought in the back of your head, but you never think you're going to. Mm. If you thought that you were going to get caught, you probably wouldn't be doing what you're doing, (laughs) you know? Yeah. But then again, having said that, that's probably not 100% true either. You're continuing to do what you're doing because you're addicted to this drug and you're going to do whatever you have to do to get it. So you're not really thinking about that side because you don't really have a choice once you're addicted. That's it, yeah. That need overshadows everything else. What was your first brush with the law? I got in trouble first when I was 14 maybe, 13, 14. I ended up in a kids' detention centre, only overnight. But, yeah, my first stint in jail was when I was 20, and that was for heroin offences. That was... My first big one. That was five years. So five, yeah. How did you feel when that sentence came through? Oh, devastated. Mm. I was 20. Still a kid, really. But I've always led my life saying, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've always lived. So, I mean, I've done what I've done. I've always pled guilty to what I've done and accepted the consequences. What was the prison life like in Perth? It wasn't really a huge deal to me because I knew a lot of people in there. Right. (laughs) So that made a difference. 
if I was walking into the jail not knowing anybody, it would have been a lot harder because this is a new experience. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what to do, all that type of thing. But I walked in and straight away, hey, 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 hi. <laughs> you know, I knew a lot of people there. So other people that you'd been in in the rounds with, with yeah. in drug circles and yeah. stuff? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah. they kind of had you back. Well, yeah. It's like you sort of go over, talk to them, okay, so what's the go here? What what happens? And, yeah, you just get on with it. When you get into prison, obviously you're not doing heroin <laughs> daily and you start to withdraw. What was that process like for you? At that time I was very sick because I was coming off methadone as well. Mm -hmm. So you're coming off methadone, you're coming off heroin. So it's like a double whammy. But I didn't realise at the time I was very, very sick when I first went to jail. So I was vomiting up green stuff all the time. I couldn't stand up straight. I had to stand hunched over because I was just in agony. I went to the medical centre many, many times saying there's something wrong with me. And they just dismissed it thinking, oh, she's just another junkie trying to get medication. Well, that wasn't the case. Yeah, not everybody who's a heroin user is like that yeah. and I'm not like that. Anyway, this went on for weeks and one of my girlfriends, like they all knew I was sick, there's something wrong. She had a visit that day and got some heroin in. She gave me some. Then I went back to my cell to lay down because I was just so sick. One of the officers on duty that day knew me and was like, if she's complaining, there's something wrong because she doesn't complain. Mm. There has to be something wrong. They called a doctor from the outside to come in. He walked into my cell, took one look at me and said, get her out of here. What are you people doing? Took me straight to hospital. The doctor there said, get her out of here, take her to the other hospital where they told me you are so lucky you were brought in tonight because when they would have unlocked you in the morning, they would have found you dead. Really? Yeah. I was that sick. So everything in my body was turning to poison. That was the green vomit that I was vomiting up all the time. What yeah. was it? The surgeons still don't know. They said we don't know whether it's something you've had since you're a baby. We don't know whether something was triggered when you were withdrawing. They said we don't know. Were they able to fix it? They did an operation which they thought was enough. It wasn't. I ended up having to have another operation. This went on for years and years. But, yeah, I'm all right now. But that was scary. you going to the, a medical centre talking with doctors and nurses, explaining you're sick, there's something really wrong, and they're just dismissing you like, oh, go away, you'll be right, have Panadol. A year into your prison stay, your mother died from a heroin overdose. Do you remember that call coming through? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was horrible. Getting caught up like that to get a phone call, that doesn't happen unless it's bad news. So right. I knew there's something that's happened. I was thinking maybe something could happen to one of my brothers. The last thing I expected to hear was that mum was dead. That was just devastating. My sister was in jail with me at that time as well. Just devastating because mum was everything to us. She was always there for us. Didn't matter what. Mum really had unconditional love for all of us. So that was really horrible to know that, you know, we're going to get out of jail and she's not going to be there. And you were 21. 21, yeah. Were you allowed to go to her funeral? We got the choice. We could either go to the viewing of her body or go to the funeral. I chose the funeral and so did my sister. So we were handcuffed to prison officers and went to the funeral like that. What's that like? It was horrible. Do you sit at the back? Are no, you allowed to? We're at the front, but they're sitting there handcuffed to you, which was horrible, but in the big scheme of things, who cares? Yeah. You said that your friend managed to get you a little bit of heroin in prison. Were you still using at this point? Were they able to get you more or were you clean for the rest of your prison stay that first time? Oh, no. I was using not all the time, but many times. Yeah, right. If they think you've been using or drinking. They make you do a urine. You know, I was caught many times and put in the punishment cells. <laughs> you know, oh, well, it's, it's part of it. Part of the addiction. Yeah. 
When you were released from prison, what did you do? Where did you go? So I got out. I had to do six months of community work. Once that was finished, I was free. Before that six months was done, I couldn't go anywhere. So, yeah, Stephen was in Thailand at that time. So I went over there to live. And what was he doing in Thailand? Well, the offence that I was in jail for, he was wanted as well on the same crime. So my lawyer said to me, look, you've just been given a five-year sentence to serve. If you've got five, he'll do 15. So I got a message to him and said, don't come back. What's the point? Why have two people in jail when you can just have one? So he'd been in Thailand that whole time. Yeah. And you, when you were released, went to join him. Yeah. What did life look like at the start when you were with Stephen over in Thailand? Oh, it was great. For a heroin addict, it's the best place to be. The heroin's cheap. It's pure. (laughs) Yeah. I was living a great life. So how did the situation with Stephen coming back to Melbourne and getting caught happen? What was the circumstances around that? So he was doing a run. He had a kilo on him. Okay in his suitcase, and he was arrested at Melbourne Airport. And you were still in Thailand? I was still in Thailand. How did you find out? I got a phone call from his dad. Right. As soon as I picked up the phone and heard his dad's voice on you. Did you think to come back or were you like, I'll stay here and wait? Or No, that was my plan, to finish up things that I had to do in Thailand and I was going to go to Melbourne. But, yeah, it didn't happen. <laughs> a few months later you were arrested? A few weeks later. A few weeks? It yeah, was only weeks. it wasn't long, yeah. How did it go down? I'd gone to a post office to post a calendar back to myself in Australia that had 15 grams of heroin hidden in the calendar and, yeah, I was arrested that night. I know this is a very specific question, but how do you hide drugs in a calendar? I knew somebody that that was their job. Oh. They made fake passports, driver's licence. So into the paper. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So they caught you Mm. and you found out that they'd actually been tracking you for quite a while. Three months. And living next door to you? Yeah. The night I was arrested, one of the cops said, oh, do you recognise this guy? I said, no. He said, oh, he's been living next door to you for three months. And then I remembered that I'd been in the lift with this guy once. And he'd talk to you? No. I smiled at him. As you do, you know, getting in a lift with somebody, you smile, and he quickly looked away from me. And I thought that was really strange, but then it made sense when mm. I heard who he was. Yeah. So getting arrested in Thailand is obviously a very different scenario to getting arrested in Australia. What are the laws over there in terms of getting caught with drugs? What are the potential sentences that you're looking at? Oh, death. I wasn't looking at death and I never thought I would be. Mm -hmm. My amount was small. Yeah. So I was never worried about getting a death sentence. But it would be a big sentence given Thailand. Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, you get to the airport in Thailand and there's just signs everywhere. They don't muck around. They're serious. I know I've asked you this before, but weren't you worried when you were over there getting caught? This happening? No. Because you never think you're going to get caught. That's the thing. Way at the back of your head you think, oh, well, there's always a possibility. But it's that far back in your mind that you just keep doing what you're doing. Unless you've been in an addiction, it's hard to get your head around things I'm saying. It because is. Because it's, it's unthinkable. But an addiction like that, once it's got you, it's got you. <laughs> it's got all of you. You were arrested alongside a co-accused, Bob. Mm -hmm. Was he arrested for the same thing as you? What was your involvement with him? Bob was also on the run in Thailand. He'd lived there probably about 10 years. So him and Stephen ended up living together. They were both on the run. They were both friends. Not far from where they lived, another Aussie guy lived who was also on the run in Thailand. So, yeah, once Stephen was arrested, this was a couple of weeks later, Bob came to pick me up one night from my place. We lived in separate houses and I was going to post the calendar that night. 
So I said to him, can you drive me to the post office, which he did. He waited in the car. I went in and posted it, got back in the car. I was hungry. I said, do you want to go and get something to eat? He said, yep. We drove not far. There was nowhere to park. So I said to him, just keep doing laps around the block and I'll just jump in when you come around. So I've jumped in the car, gone to pull the door closed and just all these cops have run out the car. But I didn't know they were cops because you hear all the time of foreigners getting robbed for jewellery, the money. So I thought we were getting robbed. So I'm trying to close the door while these guys are trying to pull it open and I'm telling Bob, floor it, just go, get out of here. But there was nowhere to go. There was too much traffic. We couldn't pull out. And then we realised, oh, they're cops. You didn't speak Thai at the time. Were they speaking to you in English? Very broken English. So you you kind of got the gist that they were arresting you. Yeah. And where did they take you? They put us both in separate cars. I didn't know where we were going at first. They kept asking me, where do you live? I said, I don't have an address. What do you mean you don't have an address? I said, I stay with friends, you know. Might stay at this friend's house for a while, then I'll go to another friend's house. And they kept asking me and I was like, I keep telling you I don't have an address. Then I realised, well, going back to my apartment, they knew where I lived. So, yeah, they took me up to the apartment, searched the apartment, found another calendar which had heroin in it. It was funny how it happened because they took Bob back to his apartment as well where he had, I think it was 120 grams or 140. They found a gun there. So our charges got put together. How's that fair? That's how it is over there. Right. So Bob, not so much, but I was freaking out because it's like I didn't have all that. I had 30 grams. That was at my house and in my possession. I'm not (laughs) getting charged with Bob's. Why? Mm. doesn't make sense. But we were charged together and it took a long time for it to be separated. Because you kind of appeared in court shackled together, didn't you? Oh, yeah. That was how they did it over there. Yeah. What is a Thai courtroom like or what was that first experience in a Thai courtroom like? That first time in the courtroom was horrible because we were both really sick. We were the only foreigners there. Bob had been in jail before, so he sort of knew a few Thai words. It was a very brief appearance. We both pled not guilty. Uh, They asked us to sign papers at the end. I said, no way. Well, why not? I said, it's in Thai. I don't know what it says. I could be signing anything. So we didn't sign anything. Yeah, and every time after that was pretty much the same. Yeah. Where did they keep you? Because you weren't going straight to the prison then, were you? You were kept at the lock-up situation for a while? Yeah, you kept in a lock-up and the other women who were there said that you stay there for two weeks and then you transferred to the jail. Right. But for Bob and I... I don't know why. I never knew the reason. We were kept there for a month. What did it look like, that lock-up situation? So it was just a cell and in one of the corners was a tiny, like, square area. It had a bucket of water and a tap and a toilet in the ground. That was it. How did you survive that part? That was your induction, really, into the Thai system. I've never in my life ever thought about killing myself. But I did there. Right. Yeah. I thought, you know what, if this is it, I'm not doing it. So, yeah, I did contemplate how I was going to kill myself. You're in this dirty, filthy cell and you're thinking, wow, if, if this is it, it was bad. Because that's not meant to house people for a long time, as you said. Like no. two weeks is a long time. Yeah, but a month. Anyway, yeah. but a month is, yeah. Yeah, and you're in there 24 hours a day unless you're taken out for an interview or you have to go to court. That's it. The lights are left on all the time. We were right near the airport, so you're listening to planes come and go all the time. You don't sleep. I couldn't eat the food. Why? It's too hot, too spicy. Too spicy. Oh, yeah. Like, it was red hot. So I was lucky I had money. I could pay the cleaner there to go outside and buy me food and bring it back. I hadn't even thought of that. Thai food is spicy. Once I got to the prison, it took me six months to adjust to the diet. I had diarrhoea for six months. It was a big change in the food. You said the lockup was bad, but prison, was that worse? Oh, yeah. That was next level insane. 
That was a crazy place. When did you get transferred? You said you were a month there, but you didn't actually get sentenced for a, a few years. Yeah. So there's two sections there. One section held 2,000 people. That's where you go if you're on remand. Mm -hmm. Then when you're sentenced, you go into the other section where there was 6,000. So you spent the first three years in the smaller section. Yeah. Tell me about walking in there. What was it like? What did it smell like? What could you see? Not much because I went in at night. So, yeah, you couldn't really see much, but you could hear the televisions on in all the cells and people talking. Then I was taken up to the first floor, standing outside the cell waiting for the screws to come to open the door, and I'm standing there looking into the cell because it's all bars. You can see in. And I was like, oh, my God, there's like 120 women in there. And I was looking for a foreign face. And there wasn't any. There was only ties. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, it was insane. I've gone in there and I've said, does anyone speak English here? One girl put her hand up and said, yeah, I do. And I was like, oh, thank God for that. There's one. One. So she was like the boss of the room. She gave out, you know, money, coupons, uh, decided who slept where, all that type of thing had to go through her. So... She was like, okay, we'll work out where you're going to sleep. And I was, I was looking around thinking, well, there's no space. What, what do you mean? Where am I going to sleep? Yeah. And she went down each line, counted how many were in a line, and I went into the one that had the least people. I was just mind blown. When you say line, I think we need to spell this out for the listeners. You were lying down on the floor with no blankets, no pillows, nothing, just a hard floor, back to front with people. So you could buy blankets there. Right. No, it wasn't just on the hard floor. You may have one blanket that you'd fold in half and you'd lay on that. Okay. You could buy pillows that were illegally made in the factories there. So it wasn't a pillow, but you had something to put your head on. Yeah, so you put into this line and it felt like it was 50 degrees in that cell. You know, the lights never get turned off. There's a couple of tiny little ceiling fans, that when the screws want to have a laugh, they turn them off. So then you're lying down in this line of people, but you can't lay on your back. There's not enough room. So every single person's laying on their side and you're stuck to each other. There's no room. So you're literally, your back is against someone, your yeah. front is against someone yeah. and you can't move. You can't move. So if somebody gets up to go to the toilet, for example, they come back, their spot's gone. So you've got to wake up the people like, move, move, so they can get back in. If one person wants to swap sides, the whole line has to swap sides. It's crazy. That doesn't sound humane. It's not. There was nothing humane about that jail, nothing at all. You know, you go to a prison in Australia, for example, and, you know, I'm sure many countries around the world, you get what's called a welcome pack. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the basics, toothpaste, toothbrush, shampoo, conditioner, body wash. You're given the essentials, the bare essentials. Over there you're given nothing, not one thing. You have to buy everything. This is why it was so horrible to see people in there that had no money and no family visits, no nothing. Even for me, for people with money, Living there day in and day out, it was a daily struggle to survive. You know, people are dying around you because they get sick. There's no medicine. There's no medical care. I was in the toilet one day and I watched a lady stand up to pull her knickers up. Her knickers had, like, been tied in knots because there were that many holes in them. They were falling apart. She couldn't afford new ones. She didn't have any money. Seeing stuff like that breaks your heart. It's like, how can this be? How are people living like this? You know, there was a lot of theft there. People had no choice. How else are they going to have stuff? They have to steal it. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bass. 
I'm speaking with Holly Dean Johns about her time in a Thai women's prison. Well, you talk a lot about the politics of the prison and there being a lot of owing people money. Mm. Is that part of this, that people are borrowing money and then having to pay it back purely just to live? Yeah. And this is the other crazy thing that when I tell people, they just can't believe it and I couldn't either. You work like a slave there. It's really like slave labour. So you get paid a salary every three months, which is nothing. It worked out to be equivalent probably to 10 Australian dollars. $10? Yeah, for three months, right? So the people that had no money, they relied on that, even though it's nothing. It's something, and at least they can buy some things they need. So after that three months, you get your salary, but you have to contribute to the water and to the electricity. Of the prison? Yeah. How much of the $10 would go towards that? I can't remember. I can't remember how much it was too long ago, but yeah. So you're paying to run the prison as well as being in the prison? Yeah, everybody. You said it took you six months to get used to the food. What was the food like? Again, I was lucky. I didn't have to eat the government food. Okay. It looked disgusting. I obviously tried it. You know, I had stones in it, had hair in it. Why would it have stones in it? Well, all this stuff's getting made in outside kitchens. You're not in a nice restaurant-type kitchen. You're outside. Yeah, right. About six years into my sentence, all the food changed, all the government food changed, and it was actually decent food. Okay. Like it was decent. You wouldn't mind eating it. So, yeah, if there, you couldn't get any food at the shop, you'd eat that and it okay. was fine. Let's talk about your sentence before we get more into the day-to-day. We've mentioned you were sentenced three years in and you received 31 years Were you expecting that? Was that a surprise for you? No, it wasn't a surprise. I knew I was going to get a big sentence. So that was just kind of another day for you then, just finding that out? No, it wasn't just another day. I was extremely happy that day because at that time, Australia and Thailand had a treaty, a transfer treaty. So if you had a numbered sentence, which I did, 31, I could apply to transfer home when I hit the four-year mark. My brother and sister came that day for my sentencing. As soon as my sister heard that, she broke down. She was crying beside herself. And I said, stop crying. This is a good thing. And she was like, how can this be a good thing? And I explained to her, I've only got one more year left. I can come home. So she was like, oh, okay. So that's all I was looking towards because I knew that that was in place. So I just wanted to be sentenced as quickly as possible. You said you saw your sister and your brother Mm. three years in. That was your first contact with family? Oh, we'd been writing and stuff like that, but, yeah, I hadn't seen them. I didn't even know they were coming that day. Had you had contact with Stephen? Just via mail. Right. And messages through family. That was it. That's so hard. Like, you're going through this insane experience with no support. Yes and no. I mean, the people you're in jail with, they are your support. You know, when you're living with somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you become close with people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you help each other. You know, you try and help people to make it a bit less hard. (laughs) Yeah. So that's what you do. Were there other Aussies there? Two other women and other foreigners. There were a lot of foreigners. But at that time, not where I lived, there was only like a handful of us. But once I was sentenced and put in the other section, that was terrific. That was a different world. Like a better world? Yeah. Why? You had more freedom. The first section's very tiny. Like there's nowhere to go, which is why everyone wants to get to that section because it's massive. It's huge. And are the sleeping arrangements any better? Same. Same. The amount of space you had was 22 centimetres. That was it. Like I'm trying to think, 
A human doesn't fit in 22 centimetres. Tell me about it. <laughs> These lines were drawn so everybody knew this is where your blanket ends. So you would have to kind of scrunch up as well as being to oh. try and fit into that space. And, I mean, you're a, an Australian. We're tall. We're not small people. I wasn't then. I was tiny. <laughs> there was nothing on me. But anyway, still. Not even a child fits in 22 centimetres. No. Like, that's it. That's all you got. What happened when women got their periods in the prison? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you're squashed together. So many times people would wake up with the girl sleeping next to them's blood on them. It's not their fault. No. But it's disgusting. Can't help it. I actually saw something that I'd never seen before. The Thai women had never seen tampons before. Ever. And that's what us foreigners use. Mm. Many, many times a Thai would walk past and see them and thought it was a lolly. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I realised, oh, okay, tampons cost money. They can't afford to buy tampons. They all use sanitary pads, all of them. So, yeah, when they knew they had their period, they'd put, you know, a sanitary pad in down and then they put one between their bum cheeks. I said, why are you doing that? And they said, so the blood wouldn't go on to the person sleeping next to them. It would, like, soak it up. I'd never seen that before. (sighs) Yeah. It's just... It blows your mind. It does. If I hadn't been there and seen all this with my own eyes and gone through this experience, I would never believe what I'm telling you now. Mm. How could you believe that, that this is actually how it is, that people live like this? Can you take me through an average day? Like when were you waking up? Were you then going to work, coming home? I mean, back to the cell. Yeah. What did it look like? So in the first section, there wasn't much work. Okay. Because there were so many people and not enough jobs. So it took me a long time to get a job. So you'd sit under tent, big massive tent all day. So not in the cell at least. You only had to go to the cell overnight. So you could just sit in the main area. Yeah, that's it. How boring. Yeah. How did you pass the time? Sit, talk. (laughs) That's it. What else can you do? Then in the other section, oh, there's heaps of work. Everyone works. There's nobody that doesn't work. And you want to work. You want to keep busy. You don't want to just be sitting there doing nothing. So, yeah, you know, you're up at five, get out of the cell six, go and shower, buy food, start your day. What kind of jobs did you have? I was making flowers at one stage, packing tobacco papers. All this work comes in from the outside. Yep. I was sewing clothes, like beaded and sequin stuff. I know you said you had your group of friends that became like family, but... On the whole, were the women in the prison friendly, hostile? What was that environment like? A bit of both. A lot of people in there had mental health issues. First section I went in, the first time I saw anything like this was just like, wow. There was a lady there that had gone mad. So as soon as she was unlocked in the morning, they'd put a chain around her ankle and chain her to the staircase, she was left there all day. Just because she was acting? She was mad. What else are you going to do with a mad person? Chain them up. You've mentioned how dirty it was and how much illness there was. I'm imagining a lot of bugs, a lot of rodents. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you'd be asleep and wake up with a flying cockroach on your face. Oh. I got bitten by a centipede one night on my foot. I woke up in the morning, my foot looked like it had a giant golf ball on it. I had diarrhoea for days, headaches for days, fevers. And what kind of illnesses would sweep through the prison? There was a lot of TB in there. Very often announcements would be made in the morning over the PA system, don't share utensils, don't share drinking cups, because, yeah, that was huge in there. Conjunctivitis, that was another thing that once people got it, it just swept through the jail. I had that twice. 
So that's really, really bad eye infections. Yeah, mine was so severe. Once I got back home to Australia and saw a doctor, I've got a lot of scarring on my left eye from that because you don't get medicine. No. And because of that, there would be a lot of death in prison. Oh, yeah. So that became normal? Yeah. Everything at first is shocking, but then it becomes your normal. You see stuff and it's like, oh, yeah. You become desensitised to it. Because if you don't act like that, you're not going to get by. You're not going to make it. You too will end up mentally unwell. If you feel comfortable, I also just wanted to touch on the passing of your friend in prison Mm. and how that happened because you talk a lot about how she was very, very unwell and the circumstances in which she had to live Like there was no improvement for people that were dying. There was nothing. There was one cell that was dedicated to the sick. Nobody was allowed into this cell. The screws never went in. There was sickness in there. You never knew what people had or whatever. When I first went to jail, I was that scared of getting sick that I went and saw the doctor and I said, I want to get vaccinated for everything. And this was a Thai doctor and he couldn't understand why. Why why would you want to do that? I said, look where we are, man. (laughs) There's a lot of sickness in here. I don't want to die. So he wrote prescriptions which were given to the embassy. They filled the prescriptions and brought them back to me when we had a visit. I had to pay for all those myself. Yeah, but it probably was worth it. It I saved your life. I didn't care. And I didn't really have the money. You know, I wasn't flush with money either, but... I would rather have those vaccines rather than eat pretty much. So, yeah, for me, I was glad that I did that because when my friend was sick, I did go into that cell. Oh, you could. Well, I wasn't allowed to, but I did. I was just like, well, I've been vaccinated for everything and I'm careful I wouldn't be touching blood or anything like that. So, yeah. Were families allowed to say goodbye? With Ong, she'd been in jail oh, for years and years. She'd never once had a visit from her family or her, any friends. When the jail realised that she was dying and didn't have long left, they called her family. They came. At that time, a new hospital had been built there. It was very modern. It was clean. So they took her from the, the dirty cell that she lived in. They put her in a wheelchair and rushed her over to the hospital section and put her in a bed, which had nice clean sheets, proper bed, sterile environment, nurses walking around. At that time, she couldn't talk or anything. She was incoherent. As soon as her family walked out of the jail, they put her back in the wheelchair and put her back in the dirty cell on the floor. So it's just, it's all about a mask. It's letting people see what they want you to see. People aren't seeing the the real thing. Even when outside visitors would come in, certain areas would get painted. They'd bring in pot plants. I don't know where they came from. (laughs) Pot plants. Yeah, beautiful pot plants, greenery everywhere, and the place would just change. But is this because the prison didn't have the money to keep this stuff up or they wanted it to be dirtier and grosser than it was? What do you think? The reason was? Honestly, I don't don't know. I think that's just how it's always been. That's a question I can't answer. I think because it's always been like that, it's just people accept it. Being treated like dogs. Yeah. That's another thing I mentioned, the difference between Thai people and the foreigners. You know, if we were told to do something and like we didn't want to do it, we'd say no. The ties would say yes. Like what? So there was one time where everybody had a prison account. So if you had a visit, your visit could put money onto this account. So the women that did these accounts, other prisoners, said, look, it's become a hassle. If they're not writing down where the, what cell they're in, what building they're in, it's too hard. Right, it's more work for them. 
So one day there was a big announcement on the PA saying, as from today, if people get money put onto their books and their visits don't put their cell number, their building number, et cetera, there'll be punishments. And That's not your fault. No. And <laughs> we were all like, okay, but how can this start today? We haven't even told our visitors yeah. about this. Starts today. Okay. So not long after that, my name and about 15 others were called up to the main office and I was like, oh, I wonder what this is about. It's a bit weird. Well, we were all getting punished because <sighs> <laughs> our visitors hadn't put the right information down. And I said, well, yeah, like, of course. How could they? Well, I told you it was starting that day. So all the sewerage and everything that was underground, we were told that we were going to get greased up and we had to go down into the shit pit and bucket out all the waste in there. Was that a job that had to be done or was that just a punishment? That was a job that got done, but not by us, by certain prisoners as like their job. But, yeah, this day she decided, no, we can do it. What a horrible job. Yeah. I said, no, I'm not doing it. Did you do it? Did they make you do it? How are they going to make me do it? (sighs) I said to the the other girls, I said, don't do it. I said, are are you crazy? And they're like, oh, no, we have to. We'll get bashed or blah, blah. I said, who cares? I said, look where we are. How much worse can anything get? There's no worse than this. This is rock bottom. Say no. But would you get punished physically for that? Yeah. I didn't. I'm a foreigner. So they were a, a little bit more wary. This is when I first got there. I didn't know about all these rules and I was talking to one of them, Screws, and I was standing up talking. Well, you're not meant to. You've either got to be on your knees or shorter than they are. Oh. And she punched me on my back. Get down. And I was like, what is going on? (laughs) It's like, I'm just new to this place, but Mm. this is how you learn. So just things like that. You're going into a culture that's total opposite to yours. Yeah. It's a different world. I guess I didn't think to ask about punishments because what you were living in felt like punishment enough. <laughs> but there was punishments on top of that. There were solitude areas and that kind of thing as well. There was another thing that people find astounding as well. So many times you come back from a day in court and people might be given bail. So they know, oh, I'm going home. So... The screws would tell them, strip naked, we want you to run around nine times around the water tank area and then you can go. Why? For their amusement. Just humiliation. Yeah, that's what it was. Every day is about humiliation. They want to degrade you. They want to humiliate you. That's what life is in there. So there's no rehab. There's nothing. We couldn't even study the foreigners. The Thais could, we couldn't. Like, what a waste. Yeah. You know, you're not just there for a few months or a couple of years. We were all doing more than like 10 years or more. And there was, what, 8,000 people? Six. And then 2,000 in the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's a mad, mad place. A week into prison, you managed to get your hands on some heroin and that helped numb things for a while? Oh, yeah. I didn't want to know what was happening. I just wanted to be as numb as I possibly could. So, yeah, I was doing heroin. I was buying antidepressants off people. Did that for about 10 months, yeah. What made you decide to stop? Because you stopped taking drugs. You know, you hear people when they say, I had a light bulb moment. Would that really happen to me? I woke up this day and I was sitting on the ground and I was just looking around at what's going on around me and I just thought, oh, my God, look where you are. Look where you are, Holly. Look what you've done to yourself. You've ruined your life. You've ruined everything. You've disappointed your family. You've disappointed your friends. But most of all, look what you've done to yourself. This is going to be your life for a long time. Something just clicked in me that day and I was like, no, that's it, I'm done. 
I'm never, ever touching drugs ever again. And I didn't. And you haven't? I haven't. No. But how do you get through that experience without the numbing of drugs? Look, up until then, I hadn't even wanted to learn Thai. Wasn't interested. But I had the realisation that day that I want to have the best possible life I can have in here and I don't want to do that stoned. I want to know what's going on. I want to have my wits about me and I want to make the best life I can. So the four-year getting out thing didn't happen? Mm, No. It took seven and a half years. Yeah. What changed? How did that transfer process of getting you back to an Australian prison happen in the end? So... Me getting knocked back to return home had never happened before, ever, to anybody, anywhere. So that day the embassy came and told me. I thought he was kidding. I thought it was a joke. And he said, I'm not joking. And I said, what do you mean you're not joking? He said, you've been denied. I said, how? How have I been denied to come home? I'm an Australian citizen. And he said, I know. He said, we can't believe it. He said, we're all shocked. We don't get it. <laughs> and I said, well, what do I do? He said, I don't know. This so never why? Happened. Why were you knocked back? So the reasons for me getting knocked back was there was a quote in the paper. So my boyfriend was at home at that time. WA is not a dating service. Okay, so they thought that you were just going to come back to be with Seven. him. Like, so I could visit him in jail, so we could have him to prison visits. Regardless, who cares? Exactly. Like, that's not... (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And that's everyone's reaction. The other thing was that because I had been in jail before when I was younger and obviously had re-offended... Okay. I was likely to re-offend again. Right. That was another reason. So they thought that you'd... Deserved to be in a Thai prison? Yeah. Like there was quotes in the paper. She committed a crime in Thailand. She can stay in Thailand. So did you change her mind? How did it change? Stephen's parents were instrumental in getting me back. They just kept fighting for me. They were going to Parliament House often. Another couple of good friends as well were also with them behind the scenes doing whatever they could. I had been sick in Thailand. You can't get any help there. So eventually things happened and two doctors were able to come into the jail to access my records and talk to me. That was sort of the turning point of everything changing because they realised that the issues that I had been experiencing couldn't be looked after in jail. I had to come home where I could get medical care. So that was one reason to get me back. The other reason being I'm an Australian citizen. Get me out of here. You know how I'm living. You know what the conditions are like. Why would you want me here? Hmm. No one could get their head around that. So you were released on December 6, 2012, but you were told you had to serve another five years back home in Perth. How did you feel about that? The federal government at that time suggested three and a half years, but the lady whose decision it was said five. Right. So she still had that little bit of influence in the end. Yeah. So when the embassy came to visit me with these terms and conditions, I said, yeah, no worries. I'll sign. It's better than a Thai prison. Yeah. And, you know, I'd be able to see my family. Mm-hmm. I'd be able to see my friends. I'd be able to study. They didn't allow you to study in, in Thailand. The Thais could. Foreigners couldn't. So, you know, being stuck in, in the Thai jail, you can't do anything for yourself. You can't get educated. There's nothing. So that was a big thing for me, knowing I was going back to Australia because I knew I could study there. I can't imagine it was hard saying goodbye to the prison itself, but what about the people? Oh, Horrible. I got the best news of my life. You know, you're going home. And I was ecstatic, but I didn't want to project that because my mates, they were still here. They were stuck. Yeah. So, you know, obviously they were happy for me, but from my perspective, I didn't want to 
shove that in their faces. It's a strange thing to say, how did a hot shower feel? How did a warm bed feel oh. in a prison? <laughs> but that's what we're, the reality is. You were going back to, I guess, what you would call a more comfortable prison. What was that like? First shower I had with hot water. Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. Even in a prison? <laughs> yeah. Eating a hot meal. Wasn't often you had a hot meal. It was always cold. Yeah, sleeping in a bed, that was strange for a while. I got vertigo because it was so high off the floor. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't sleep with a pillow for a long time. Just didn't feel right. In Thailand, when you're walking in a building, you can't wear shoes. So I automatically would get up and just walk out. I'm like, got to put shoes on. Oh, okay. Like things have been drummed into you for so many years, it just becomes normal. So then you're having to sort of change again. I know that signing the deal of going home to five years, you know, wouldn't have felt like a lot in the moment because you're like, at least I'm not here, I'm going home. But five years is still a long time. Oh, yeah. People ask me those sorts of questions all the time and my response is, look, if you're put in that position, you do it. Everyone's got something deep down inside of them that they pull out when they have to. I mean, yeah, sure, there are certain people that wouldn't have that and I saw a lot of people that didn't. But for, for the most part, look, I've always been a very positive person. I've always been mentally strong. I don't surround myself with negative people. I don't think negatively. So my mindset was a huge force in getting me through with what I did, 100%. Did you ever think about going to the media when you were over there? No, never. Why? Because in order for me to be able to get home, I was given the advice, fly under the radar, don't be doing a Chappelle Corby. Yep. That won't do you any favours. And I also thought that too. So I thought, you know what, I don't want to be in the limelight. I don't need my name on people's lips. I just want to fade out and get home, and that's what happened. Did they try, though? Did any media try? Yeah, I had media come in posing as just fellow Australians, knowing there was a foreigner there. That happened a couple of times, and then I was told later that there was an article in the paper or a magazine. Oh, so they'd do like a sneaky interview with you? Yeah, yeah. So I had... 60 minutes flyover wanting to interview me. I said, no. Then I found out later they went to the men's prison next door and interviewed my case partner and a couple of other guys there. I wasn't interested in doing any media. It didn't interest me at all, not at all. I just wanted to get home. Yeah, That was my only interest. The media can help, but it can also hinder. You've got to take that gamble yeah. as to whether it's going to help or not. Yeah, look, at the end... If things hadn't got turned around, I would have then gone to the media yep. and I would have made a, a big deal out of what was going on. But I didn't want to have to do that and it worked out that I didn't. So it, it worked out well. So when you finally got out of prison, you'd served a collective, what, 17 years? Yeah. What did freedom feel like? Oh, amazing. People have a perception that, after having done that long, it would be a hard transition. But surprisingly for me, it wasn't. I walked out of those gates and just walked back into life. Really? Yeah. But yeah. life would have changed a lot. A lot. There were so many new suburbs, <laughs> like so many, and I'd be like, where's that? So even having to learn all that type of thing again. But what about mobile phones, mobile technology? Phones, yeah, that was a big one. I got home and Stephen rung me and my stepson gave me the phone. It was tiny. It's like that. <laughs> the last phone I remember was like a brick. So I finished talking and I'm trying to do that to hang up, pressing on the phone. He's like, no, you've got to slide it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So just the technology was like, wow. What year was this? 2012. Yeah, wow. Never seen a tablet, iPad. Yeah, I'd lay in bed every night for hours just playing on the iPads, like learning it, yeah. learning what to do and learning the phone. Yeah, it was all just new. 
And you and Stephen, you picked up where you left off all those years ago? Yeah, but that's how we always were. We just always came back together and start again. In recent years, you have lost two more siblings to heroin, to drugs. I'm so sorry for Thanks. your loss. What are your thoughts towards heroin now, now that it's so far in your past, but it is still there, it's still taking people in your life? I just think it's extremely sad that myself and my younger brother were able to get off that merry-go-round of the drugs, the jail, and they couldn't. They didn't know how. They just couldn't get out of that. That's the sad thing, knowing that you're going great, you're doing good things, you don't live that life anymore, but then you're watching them just spiralling down, 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 it's heartbreaking. Mm. You know, it's heartbreaking to watch your family, but even, you know, just other people you know or you hear about, it just breaks your heart because it is a hard thing to walk away from. It's extremely hard. I know there will probably be people listening that are currently addicted to drugs yeah, and know how hard it is. Do you have any advice for them? That's my main reason for wanting to do the work that I want to do in the future. I want to be able to sit with people and say to them, yeah, look, you're here now, but you could be where I am now. You don't have to be stuck there. I think that's a really important thing for people to see and to know. There is a way out. When you're in that position and you're that far down and you think that there's just no hope, there is. Look at me. If I can do it, you can do it. It's possible. What does your life look like in 2024? You have had a very hard year. You lost Stephen last year Mm. to cancer. But 2024 is a new year. What are you doing with yourself? How are you living now? So... When my husband got sick, I stopped work. I was a FIFO worker, so I stopped work to take care of him. Then after he passed away, I decided that now is the right time for me to do what I've always wanted to do, which is get my book published, start a new career in public speaking, motivating people, You know, I would love nothing more than to be going into prisons, rehab centres, high schools, you name it, I'm there. There would be nowhere I'd say no to because I think it's important. People have to know stuff. People have to see. It's possible. They have to have hope. They have to have hope. Look at me. I did it. You can. Does Thailand stay with you at all? What happened? Yeah, for sure. You know, that's a huge part of my life huge. Even though I had a lot of horrible experiences there, you know, good came from that as well. I stopped using drugs there. Mm. Like, I'm grateful for that. I've got nine lives. (laughs) You do. I do. I I should have been dead many, many times. And I'm here. And I just know that this is my calling. I'm meant to be doing what I'm doing now. This is it. And this is what I want. Thanks to Holly for sharing her story with us today. You can find her book, Holly's Hell, Seven Years in a Thai Prison, linked in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast, hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.